a challenging solution to a complex incisional hernia. We present the case of a 76-year-old male whose surgical history included a laparoscopic left hemicolectomy due to colon cancer, complicated with anastomotic leakage and necessity to perform a lupidiostomy. Posteriorly, he was reoperated as a consequence of both parastomal and midline incisional hernia, and ileostomy closure and mesh repair of both hernias were performed. As the midline incisional hernia reappeared and progressed, the patient was submitted to another intervention, modified component separation, where two meshes were implanted. In the immediate postoperative period, diagnosed with an ileal perforation, he underwent intestinal resection with primary anastomosis and retrieval of all meshes. As primary closure was not possible at the time, secondary wood closure with negative wound pressure therapy and skin grafts was applied. The patient was remitted to our center due to a catastrophic incisional hernia. He showed deep skin ulcerations and intestinal exposure. A recent CT scan showed a ventral hernia of the entire abdominal cavity. Marked by the colors, we see the stomach and the duodenum, the transverse colon, the pancreas and the right kidney. A multidisciplinary committee, including abdominal wall and plastic surgeons, radiologist, respiratory physiotherapist, anesthetist, nutritionist and clinical neurophysiologist was conducted. The established treatment plan involves suturing the ulcers to prevent further intestinal exposure. A 2% eosin solution was applied daily in order to disinfect and dry the ulcers. A tailored abdominal girdle was ordered and preoperative respiratory rehabilitation began. An intent of a Bonafé Carbonate modified component separation technique, previous infiltration of botulinum toxin and progressive pneumoperitoneum creation was decided. If this repair was not to be possible, the plastic surgeons were to be available to provide coverage with myocutaneous flaps. The patient was infiltrated with botulinum toxin type A using high-resolution ultrasound guidance and electromyography. Five points were identified on either side of the abdominal wall and 50 units of the toxin were administered at each injection site. A catheter for progressive pneumoperitoneum was placed by a member of the surgical team with local anesthesia at patient's bedside and, as there were no immediate complications, air was daily insufflated. Within a week, a control CT with 3D reconstructions revealed presence of air mainly in the retroperitoneum. The CT also served to calculate the hernia sac and orifice diameters. As the catheter malfunctioned, a new, CT-guided and contrast-confirmed pneumoperitoneum catheter was placed by an interventional radiologist. After total infiltration of nearly 19 liters of air, one day prior to the surgery and five weeks after the botulinum toxin infiltration, another CT scan was performed, showing a total increase of the abdominal volume of more than 6%. As we see in the comparative, the right kidney is no longer herniated. Immediately prior to the intervention, the patient underwent the following procedures. Epidural catheter placement, thorough cleansing of the abdomen, Foley catheter placement and intra-abdominal pressure measurement, intermittent pneumatic compression of the lower limbs, antibiotic prophylaxis and nasogastric tube placement. While preparing the surgical field, we see major improvement of the skin ulcerations. The skin graft zone of approximately 70 per 30 cm is marked prior to its excision. The preoperative intraabdominal pressure is measured. It is of 10 cm of water, 7 mm of mercury. The skin incision followed by complex adhesiolysis was performed. The hernia sac was meticulously preserved as it may be needed in case of difficult midline closure and also it may serve to protect the intestines if the posterior rectus sheath ruptures. While liberating the adhesions, the retroperitoneal air blisters were visualized and punctured. Finally, a skin fragment of 70 per 30 cm was excised. We proceeded with the modified component separation which consists of two levels. First level, fasciotomy of the external oblique aponeurosis, 
followed by dissection of the tissue plane between the external and internal oblique muscles, and introduction of a mesh in the newly created space. Second level, release of the posterior rectus sheath, followed by retromuscular reinforcement with a mesh. To begin the second level of the modified component separation, the preperitoneal space was accessed through the M5 level, through the remains of the previous mesh. It was followed by retromuscular dissection, 10 cm on each side, allowing a partial reintroduction of the herniated abdominal content. As full reintroduction is not possible, it was decided to continue with the first level of the modified component separation. Incision on the anterior rectus sheath was made in order to liberate the attachments of the abdominal external oblique muscles. The posterior lamina of the rectus sheath was closed with extra long-term absorbable monofilament synthetic continuous sutures. In the middle portion of the incision, as it was impossible to approximate the posterior lamina, the closure was performed using the hernia sac. Placement of transmuscular stitches for fixation of the retromuscular mesh was performed. A polyvinylidine fluoride dynameshi pom 45 per 30 cm mesh was then cut and prepared. It was attached with tuckers to the pubic bone. In the midline, from the xiphoid until the pubic symphysis, covering the posterior lamina defect, a polyglycolic acid and trimethylene carbonate mesh was placed. It was fixed using absorbable sutures to the posterior rectal sheath. Then the retromuscular mesh was fixed using the previously placed transmuscular stitches. The anterior rectus sheath was approximated with extra long-term absorbable monofilament synthetic continuous sutures. The following drawing shows how the last mesh was introduced underneath the external oblique muscle flaps. The third and final supraponeurotic large pore polypropylene mesh, hernia mesh, was fixed below the external oblique muscle flaps, therefore completing the first level of the modified component separation. Two retromuscular vacuum drains and another two under the external oblique flaps were left. The incision could be satisfactorily closed using absorbable simple sutures on subcutaneous tissue and non-absorbable mattress sutures and staples on the skin. The following illustration demonstrates the final result of the surgery and the position of all three meshes. The intraabdominal pressure immediately following the surgery was 18 cm of water, 13 mm of mercury. Following the surgery, the patient was hospitalized during 20 days in the ICU and then 17 days in the ward. The intraabdominal pressure escalated despite the use of muscle relaxants over the following hours to over 22 cm of water, 16 mm of mercury, producing severe respiratory distress. Despite the symptoms of the abdominal compartment syndrome, conservative treatment was established and no reoperation was needed. The respiratory distress improved on the sixth postoperative day, allowing extubation two days later with assistance of high flow oxygen therapy through nasal cannula. While in the intensive care unit, the patient presented two episodes of atrial fibrillation without hemodynamic instability and acute renal failure without the need for dialysis. After fulfilling the rehabilitation process, all through the postoperative period with no fever nor wound complications, he was discharged 37 days following the surgery. In the control clinical exam at six months, as well as in the control CT, he shows no signs of recurrence.